Is the tide turning against the Israel lobby's campaign to purge academia in the United States? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program. I'm Ryan Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Nader Hashimi. Nader Hashimi is a director of the Center for Middle East Studies and an associate professor of Middle East and Islamic politics at the Joseph Korbel School of International Studies at the University of Denver. Nader Hashimi, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. Thanks, Moeen, for the invitation. Um, let's uh, dive right in to your personal experience of the theme we're talking about, which is um, the campaign by um, the Israel lobby in the United States to purge academia of unwanted and particularly um, Palestinian and pro-Palestinian voices. Your case is a little different in, in that um, uh, the key event, in fact, had nothing to do with Palestine. Rather, you were asked to comment on the um, attack on the author Salman Rushdie last August, and you were asked which regional powers in the Middle East may benefit from that attack. Um, perhaps give us, uh, you know, perhaps you can summarize for us what exactly happened and, and what the subsequent response was. So last August in um, the middle of, you know, summer when everyone was on vacation, I had a, a friend who does this podcast called the Iran Podcast. She invited me on the program to talk about the recent um, assassination attempt on Salman Rushdie and to go over the, the history of the Salman Rushdie affair and talk about the, you know, the, the, the politics of Iran and the broader region that was relevant to that topic. I didn't think twice about it. It was a very small podcast, very small liter, uh, listenership. Um, I was asked a question at the end of the interview about, you know, who might benefit from um, from the attack. Um, and I made the argument that, the, you know, you know, Canada doesn't benefit, Rwanda doesn't benefit. But, you know, Israel might be a beneficiary because the attack was happening at the precise moment when there was sensitive Iran, uh, U.S. nuclear negotiations going on. And Israel has a long track record of trying to subvert the Iran nuclear deal. So among the different scenarios that I said could possibly be, you know, at play here would be a possible, you know, uh, Mossad role. I uh, consistently in all the interviews that I gave on the topic said that the most likely uh, scenario was that it was a radicalized young, you know, Muslim American kid who did this. But um, so I'm so I answered the question in that way, and then. 48 hours later, all hell broke loose. Um, so you, you were asked um, a question in your capacity as a, as a specialist and an analyst, and you provided the different scenarios that, that might have been um, at play here. Correct. And then my critics focused on the term that I used most likely. You know, I said it was most likely the Mossad, but it was most likely the Mossad in the context of the question that was posed to me, who benefits from this, not in terms of who likely did it. So there was a little bit of a, you know, um, um, of um, a poor word choice that I should have re-emphasized exactly what I was responding to. And then they seized upon that and ran with it that uh, to portray me as an extremist, as a conspiracy theorist. And then the pro-Israel lobby um, went to work. Uh, about uh, the, the, the podcast was broadcast on a Saturday. On Monday night, I get a call at 10 o'clock at night from my dean calling me from his son's wedding. That's, this is at the University of Denver. Where that's we're... right. I was in Toronto at the time. My mm -hmm. dean calls me from Denver, I believe, from his son's wedding and says, look, Nader, all hell is broken loose here. We're in for a rough ride over the next few weeks. I'm going to try and protect you. But I want you to know that this podcast that you gave has resulted in the university coming under very heavy pressure to condemn you, to repudiate what you said. Um, and so, um, you know, fasten your seatbelt. Mm -hmm. And so what happened over those last few weeks in August and into September was looking back um, an orchestrated, I think, premeditated campaign to uh, slander me, to defame me, to portray me as an extremist, and then to heavy lo heavily lobby my university to condemn me. And the university, to its great shame, actually caved into the pressure. 
So about 72 hours after the podcast was broad broadcast, um, again, to a very small audience with a very small li li um, listenership, the university um, came uh, out with a statement condemning me um, for allegedly being uh, a threat to Jews on campus. Uh, the statement also implied that I didn't know what I was talking about. I had no expertise or evidence to back up my um, speculation. So you were effectively being accused of anti-Semitism. Exactly. Um, and of course, around the same time, um, I was also um, um, uh, being accused explicitly of promoting anti-Semitism by virtue of a statement that was issued by several local um, uh, pro-Israel organizations here in Denver that explicitly in their statement um, claimed that what I said in that podcast was uh, perpetuating anti-Semitic stereotypes, imposing a threat to Jewish students on campus, and calling for the university to issue another statement against me um, um, in condemnation of what I uh, of the threat that I allegedly posed, you know, to Jewish students. So there was a, 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 a d during this time period, you know, late August, early September, there was a a media frenzy uh, that took place mostly on right wing social media. It even actually went to the U.S. Congress, where right wing social media organizations interviewed uh, members of the um, Republican Party and told them of what allegedly happened. And um, members of the Republican Party went on record as saying that once they take over the House of Representatives, they were going to launch an investigation into un-American activities at the University of Denver. That rings a bell. It rings a bell. And so, um, um, and of course, one of the, I think, key participants in this media frenzy was CNN's Jake Tapper. One of Israel's favorite journalists. One of Israel's favorite journalists. Um, he tweeted a, a picture uh, of me um, claiming that I was, quote, a pro-Iranian academic spreading a, a vile form of Jew hatred. Um, and he subsequently took the tweet down after uh, it was told to him that to call me a pro-Iranian academic, a pro-Iranian regime academic is simply ludicrous given my writings on the politics of Iran. So anyways, this was the atmosphere that was created. And the worst part of it for me was really how my own university, without even informing me in advance, that they were going to issue a statement, issued a statement in a moment of panic. Mm -hmm. um, and I was told it was in a moment of panic from senior university administrators who threw you under the bus, throw yeah. me under the bus without yeah. letting me sort of, um, you know, without consulting me or asking me about, you know, what I said and what I was trying yeah. to say. And they did it because they were under intense pressure. And even though the trigger comment had nothing explicitly to do with Israel Palestine, I think. You know, it really was all about Israel Palestine because I have a long track record of saying things that deeply upset the pro Israel lobby, such as Israelis and Palestinians are equal to the same human and national rights as everyone else on the planet. And that's enough to get charged with anti Semitism and to be uh, vilified in the way that I was. Uh, so that's in a nutshell what happened. Of course, in response to that, I had to then spend. Well, be, before before we um, uh, proceed further, I'd I'd like to ask you: Did was this incident really the beginning of the campaign against you, um, or was it perhaps the high point of a longer uh, standing effort to delegitimize you and perhaps have you removed from your post at the university? Are are there antecedents to this? Yeah, there were antecedents. So the summer before, the summer of 2021, you recall there was a major um, upsurge in violence in Israel-Palestine in the May-Gaza-Israel uh, war that mm -hmm. killed um, at least 60 children. Everyone remembers that famous image on the front page of the New York Times. Um, and around that time, there was um, the publication of the very famous Human Rights Watch report on Israeli apartheid. And a few months earlier, the Bet Selim report on um, Israel and the crime of apartheid. And so at that time, um, I co-sponsored, our center co-sponsored, along with half a dozen other um, um, academic institutions, a conference in Istanbul, Turkey, to look at the question of Israel apartheid. And it was a specific conference where Palestinian voices, Arab voices, and South African voices were able to get together. We were just one of um, you know, 13 groups that's co-sponsored it. It was in the 
if you recall at that time, the COVID crisis was still going on. The session that I participated in only had 13 people. Half of them were, you know, conference organizers. So it was, you know, I didn't give much thought to it. It was, it was, you know, I, I did my due diligence as the director of a center. I looked at, you know, who the invited speakers were, you know, on, on all sides. They seemed to be decent people. So we co-sponsored that. And then immediately after the conference was over, I get a call from my dean saying, um, that there's been a major protest here over the Center for Middle East Studies uh, co-sponsorship of this conference, and a major attack article uh, was published in the Colorado Mountain Jewish News, which is basically a Trump Netanyahu sort of, you know, um, newspaper um, uh, attacking me and attacking the university uh, for the co-sponsorship of this conference. Again, a conference on the other side of the world that had very low attendance, but all of a sudden, this crisis, you know, um, is put on the doorstep of the university, and the university had to come up with a statement: "We did not endorse this conference. Um, this is, um, you know, not something that we blessed. We had, you know, nothing to do with it." But then the dean, my dean, called me up and said, "Look, Nutter, you know, I wish you would have given us advance notice. Um, um, we're, we're in a crisis here." And then a new policy was then presented that going forward. As a result of that conference in Istanbul, the dean had to now sign off on any co-sponsored events uh, going forward. And of course, this was a new policy that was exclusively a result of the question of Palestine and because of outside pressure on the university, uh, forcing the university to come up with new policy to effectively keep um, my outside critics happy. Uh, so that was the antecedent the, of the of the event that happened in the summer of 2020. And, and when we talk about outside pressure, who are we talking about? Are we talking about particular um, uh, groups, more widespread popular campaigns, uh, figures in Congress, um, perhaps yeah. in the in the state uh, legislature? Yeah, no, it's mostly um, pro-Israel organizations, specifically the local chapter of the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. The Defamation um, League, as it's Defamation League, right, yeah. ADL. And also the local Hillel chapter. Um, Which is um, a student group, I believe. No, it's a student group, but there's also a community representative that mm -hmm. manages and oversees the affairs of students. They, and I don't, I don't have the exact detail. So this is something akin to a commissar? Yeah, I mean, someone who, you know, whose job it is to sort of just police the debate mm -hmm. on Israel-Palestine. But in both of these cases that I just mentioned, I am 100% certain that no one in Colorado actually listened to the conference in Istanbul or actually listened to the podcast interview. They were given this information from the broader pro-Israel network, and they were told, in my reading, that, look, we've got this troublemaker in Denver, Colorado. It's your job to step up to the plate and defend the home team, and that's exactly what they did. Um, it was revealed to me that during both of these crises, there were dozens of meetings between these local pro-Israel organizations and senior university officials. In every single one of those meetings where I was at the center of the controversy, I wasn't once invited to meet with these groups, to present my side of the story, to have a discussion or dialogue. And this, you know, completely undermines one of the stated aims and goals and ideals of the University of Denver um, that's uh, known as DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. There was actually no inclusion. There was absolute and total exclusion. Um, um, in all of these events, largely because I think the university um, didn't really know what they were getting into. I think this is one of the themes that I think comes out in these controversies on university campuses is that most university officials, generally speaking, are decent people. They don't really have a stake in the Israel-Palestine conflict. They don't know. They don't even know the details of the conflict. I mean, I'm of the view that my chancellor couldn't identify the Gaza Strip on a map if he had to. But what but happens? The deer in the headlights panicked. Yes, exactly. There's an immense amount of pressure, and what happens is that these pro-Israel organizations um, use weaponize charges of anti-Semitism and make the argument that um, our Jewish students on campus are now under threat. They're feeling pressured. They're uncomfortable because of the statements of this one professor. But so also silencing faculty yes. um, uh, becomes an obligation to defend the personal security 
of uh, students at that university. Exactly. And of course, then the theme of, and you can see this in the statement that was issued against me by the local pro-Israel organizations, that there is rising anti-Semitism in the world, which there is, and they connect that with me, claiming that now our students at this particular time are under a lot of pressure, and now we have this local alleged anti-Semite on campus who's made their lives much worse, and the university, without doing their due diligence, without even meeting with me, um, issues the statement, then, um, you know, forcing me to then mobilize and spend a lot of time trying to respond to these outrageous, you know, defamatory allegations. Um, uh, and there's a lot more to say on that, but... Um, did, but did but before, before we go there, um, I want to ask you an additional question. I mean, the failure of the university administration, which I'd like to discuss in more detail, that notwithstanding, were prominent members of the faculty or um, members of the university administration or perhaps university trustees involved in the direct attacks on you? And uh, as far as I know, this. no. I've, I've been able to gather information from trusted sources that this was largely driven by the chancellor's office. Mm -hmm. uh, my own personal dean, I think, was very supportive, but he basically was caught between supporting me and towing the university's line in attacking me. Mm -hmm. So he was limited in what he could do. I was also told that the provost was sympathetic to my position, but couldn't really challenge the chancellor, who was the person driving this attack on me. Um, none of the board of trustees that I know of or any other faculty members, in fact, all of the faculty members I communicated with were outraged when they heard about what happened. And who is the chancellor? Um, his name's Jeremy Hafner. He's a mathematician. Um, he doesn't know anything about the Middle East. And so when he issued this statement claiming that I was ignorant about the topic that I was commenting on, that there was no evidence or reasonable or re reasonable uh, reason to to say what I said, um, uh, I wanted to know, you know, when did our chancellor, you know, get a PhD in Middle East politics? That's not his area of specialization. Um, to my knowledge, they didn't consult with anyone. They just panicked because they were under intense pressure from these pro-Israel organizations to condemn me. And that's what they did. And, and so, so the university administration basically piled on and, and, and directly or indirectly joined the campaign against you. How did you defend yourself? Well, then I had to spend the next four to five months of my life uh, putting aside my research, putting aside my teaching, um, and trying to just mobilize um, uh, local faculty support, basically informing them what happened, what the background was, what, um, what, how I was affected, to talk about the death threats, the volume of hate mail, and how the university completely threw me under the bus. When my colleagues got wind of this, there was then a, um, um, an effort to hold the university uh, to account, and there was a big um, uh, campaign in my defense, asking the university to explain itself. And so it was after that happened, after I mobilized faculty support, that the chancellor and the provost reached out to me for a conversation and a dialogue. This is and months after the fact. It was actually several weeks after the fact. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so when I went to the first meeting, I, you know, I told them how upset and angry, angry I was over how I was treated. And I ended the meeting by putting on the table a statement, a draft statement that I wanted the university to now issue in my defense, given that my character, my scholarly reputation had been impugned by the university as a result of uh, outside pressure. I wanted them to now issue a corrective statement. Um, we went back and forth several times. I had a follow-up meeting. Um, and at every single interaction, the university steadfastly opposed the issuing of a public statement that would simply reflect um, the contribution that I made to this university over 14 years, not just as an academic, but also as the director of S the Center for Middle East Studies. Um, because you were able to uh, reference your personal record um, within the university and the center in your own defense on this. Exactly. Issue. Not not just my own record um, as um, uh, a director of the Center for Middle East Studies, but particularly I think what got the university, um, put the university in a very awkward position, it just so happens that as the director of the Center for Middle East Studies, I have a very a proud and consistent track record in um, opposing 
uh, rising anti-Semitism in the United States and on our campus. So for example, under my leadership, I've organized or co-sponsored um, as the director of the Center for Middle East Studies, six events on the broad question of uh, historic anti-Semitism, uh, the rise of anti-Semitism and how it can be you know, combated. So it's, it's not an exaggeration to say that I've actually been a leader on this campus in opposing rising anti-Semitism. Just this week, we did our sixth event and it was a public screening of the Ken Burns documentary on PBS on the US and the Holocaust. And we had a discussion around it and what it meant for today. So when I asked the university to um, you know, publicly affirm my track record, including my track record, because the question of anti-Semitism has come up in combating anti-Semitism, they refused to do so. I want you to know this, that I asked my Dean separately if he could then issue a separate statement as the Dean of the Corbell School of International Studies in my defense. And he looked at me straight in the eye and he said, Nader, I'd like to issue that statement for you, but I have to ask myself the following question. Is this the hill that I want to die on? And what he basically meant in my view that if he issued a statement that actually reflected He'd be done for. Record, he would be uh, he would be taken to task by the chancellor. Mm -hmm. And what happened next? Well, there was a long back and forth. Um, um, uh, my colleagues were um, meeting regularly with the provost and the chancellor. Um, and uh, when I realized that you know no statement was forthcoming, um, I had to then sort of gradually start to tell my own story. Um, about a month and a half ago, we had um, a public event here called um, um, Academic Freedom and the Question of Israel-Palestine, where several of my colleagues came together, several of my former students. It was a packed audience where I basically told the full story of what happened. Um, I called for, and I'm still calling for, a full, transparent, and independent investigation into this scandal that can uh, interview witnesses, subpoena documents, and publish a report that can look into and independently, um, you know, give a set of recommendations in terms of how this crisis emerged and how it can be justly dealt with to put it behind us. Um, hasn't gone anywhere yet. I think the university um, um, is now in a bit of a panic mode, knowing that uh, they've over that they that they treated me horrifically. Um, uh, there was a recent attack uh, last week where the David Horowitz so-called Freedom Center identified me as one of the worst anti-Semitic professors on campus. The university- yes, You made the top 10, uh, I believe. Made the top 10. You know, I'm sorry I didn't make top number one, largely because um, of the nature of the organization that's attacking me. I often tell my friends and students, I take great pride when- Wear it like a badge of honor. Exactly. Wear it like a badge of honor. I mean, David Horowitz is really an unscrupulous human being. And so when I get attacked by him, you know, I know I'm doing something right. So the university did issue a statement last week after the Horowitz attack came out because someone on campus distributed these newspapers attacking me. And the university realized that, look, this is egregious. Given our lack of support for Nader Hashimi last time, if we don't say something now, I think it's going to look really bad. So there was and a yet, and support. yet, um, excuse the interruption. I read that statement, and indeed, it um, quite strongly denounces the attacks on you. But then there was a rather peculiar um, concluding paragraph where um, the university, almost in a kind of subtle reference to um, uh, the issue we've been discussing goes out of its way to denounce hate speech, which is clearly not a reference to the attack against you. It's almost like um, uh, a statement condemning a horrific murder that then concludes with a paragraph stating, well, you know, not all killings are illegal. Right. I think the university was um, throwing my outside critics a bone mm -hmm. to say that, look, um, we realize that you have a different reading of this crisis and that Nader Hashemi, perhaps, according to the reading of the pro Netanyahu crowd, perhaps has engaged in some perceived level of demonization. So we want to go on record that we condemn that as well, which, of course, is completely ridiculous because I I mean, the, the, the core of the critique against me um, by the ADL in Colorado was that my speculation the ADL, the defamation league yeah the anti-defamation mm. league that my defamation. speculation about the Mossad and the Rushdie hit mm. is mm. equal to blaming Jews for what happened and therefore Jewish students on campus are now threatened by that 
um, uh, idea, which is, of course, not what I was saying or suggesting. And I made the argument um, in my public lecture that I gave on this topic last month that to make the claim that criticism of the intelligence organization of a nation state like Israel is equivalent to anti-Semitism is like saying criticizing the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps is tantamount to Islamophobia or criticizing the Chinese Communist Party is equivalent to anti-Chinese bigotry. I mean, this is just ridiculous. Nobody takes this thing seriously. But unfortunately, I think university administrators who are completely unaware of the politics of the Israel-Palestine conflict when they're confronted with um, alleged um, accusations of anti-Semitism completely panic and issue statements like the one they did against me. And then after they realize, you know, maybe they overreacted, then they try and backtrack. And so I'm very committed to sort of making sure that there's accountability for this, you know, treatment and that there's going to be an independent investigation that will fun fundamentally exonerate me, but also expose the behavior of my outside critics, because I strongly believe that unless we uh, name and shame the people who and the organizations that are responsible for this type of defamatory, unscrupulous form of politics, it's only going to get worse. But in the meantime, um, you've lost confidence in the university where you've been working and teaching for 14 years. Correct. I realize that given um, the um, inability or refusal of the university to protect me, to protect my academic freedom, that directing a center for Middle East studies, teaching courses on the Middle East um, would be increasingly difficult uh, for me to do. I remember there was one moment in the middle of this crisis where I was giving an interview to the BBC. And just before the interview starts, I sort of go into a little bit of a mini panic mode, like, oh my God, what happens if I say something in this interview that is then again misconstrued and misinterpreted? And then I have to spend the next four or months- Or distorted in effect. Or distorted, exactly. Mm -hmm. And then without, and, and I think, you know, university administrators, the lesson here is particularly on hot button issues on areas such as the Middle East, and especially on Israel-Palestine, it's impossible to run a serious academic center or teach courses unless you have university administrators that are willing to back you up when it comes to issues of academic freedom. That did exist, you know. I was I've been director for this center for ten years. For the first eight years, I had strong support from university administrators. There were small incidences where the dean would tell me, we've got this complaint about this speaker that you're bringing in. Could you just tell me why you're doing it? I would send the, the dean an email, end of discussion. But with this new uh, set of leaders that we have here at the University of Denver, I think um, it was soon realized that they are vulnerable, that they're able to be intimidated. And that's exactly what the Likud lobby uh, did uh, um, last summer and, and you know, made my life very difficult and, and, and basically sent a message to me that um, if I wanted to be able to direct a Center for Middle East Studies and teach the courses that I normally teach, I would have to um, look elsewhere for employment. And you did. And I did. So I'm, I'm happy to announce that I'm moving on after, you know, um, after 14 years here at the University of Denver, 12 years were absolutely wonderful. The last two years were um, not so wonderful. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm moving on to Georgetown and I'm hoping that I can, you know, make an intellectual contribution to my new institution. Well, congratulations. Um, you. so, so you've described um, a situation where um, a combination of outside campaigning uh, and spineless administrators uh, put you in, in this um, uh, predicament. When you look, of course, your case is, is hardly unique, but you've looked at many of these other cases. When, when, when you look at them, um, do you see a kind of a similar pattern that it tends to be a combination of this um, relentless um, uh, external um, defamation in combination with uh, with spineless leadership that, that leads to situations such as yours, or is it kind of different in every case? No, I, I think the broad picture is exactly as you described it. There's constant surveillance, constant moderate, moderate um, monitoring of everything that uh, certain academics, me being one of them, say. That's actually what happened to me during that podcast. I didn't think anyone was monitoring me. I realized now looking back 
that every word that I speak now, every word that I write is being every monitored. breath you take, every breath you take is being monitored by these effectively, um, mm -hmm. you know, pro Netanyahu hate mm -hmm. groups who hate Palestinians fundamentally. I think that's what's driving them. Um, and then you could be, you know, uh, taken to task for something that you um, um, said where your intention was completely distorted, your words were completely you know, um, uh, mangled. So I think the broad picture is exactly as you described it. You have constant monitoring, constant surveillance, constant sort of um, um, uh, poking and looking for opportunities to police the debate on Israel-Palestine and to get university administrators, many of them who have no background in the Middle East, to sort of cave into pressure. I mean, that's very much what happened at the famous case at the University of Toronto Law School, where um, there was basically a similar incident where the dean, after being lobbied by a pro-Israel donor, effectively canned the hiring of a distinguished yes. human rights scholar, producing then a big scandal, not that different from what happened to me. Um, and so I think that very much is the big picture. And I think the key ingredient here is really unprincipled and cowardly university administrators who are, um, I think, prone to... Um, prostrate themselves in many cases, or at least orient themselves to outside private donor pressure. This is the world, I think, that university presidents, chancellors, and provosts inhabit. It's really interacting with these donors. And so there's a lot of vulnerability there. And when you know push comes to shove, unfortunately, not all the time, but in some cases, these university administrators will not do the right thing but will often cave into the pressure that they, they're being subjected to. And I made an argument that what's happening here on university campuses um, is very much a microcosm of the crisis of American democracy, because what we're seeing is our democratic institutions are being slowly corrupted by private interest groups who lobby, who have a lot of organizational capability and a lot of resources, and they get um, senior officials at democratic institutions whose job it is to do the right thing, to cave in to private pressure. And I think the US Congress is a perfect example of this. And universities, I think, are also you know, caught up in this power play where instead of university administrators during those key moments where they have to make a decision, do you stand up for academic freedom? Do you stand up for faculty? Do you, uh, do you exercise due process before you issue a statement? They, they immediately capitulate um, to outside pressure and creating the scandal that 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 affected me, but also I think affects our our democracy as a whole. And so this is a, a problem that I think needs to be dealt with. I don't think it's going to go away anytime soon. And I think anyone who cares about you know academic freedom, who cares about human rights, who cares specifically about a just resolution of the Israel Palestine conflict, has to be aware of of, of the dynamics of this type of you know political behavior. Mm -hmm. And, and we've seen a number of high profile cases in, in, in recent years, in recent decades. Of course, um, uh, Norman Finkelstein at DePaul University, who was um, denied tenure after being um, uh, overwhelmingly endorsed for it. We have the case of Joseph Massad at Columbia University, who ultimately was able to, to retain his uh, position. How do, you, how do you view this um, uh, broader campaign? I think the campaign is continuing. I think what's changed over the years from the time that I sort of got involved in um, you know, campus politics, interested in the question of justice for Palestinians, um, what's changed is that public opinion has changed. Um, intellectual- Particularly opinion, on campuses. Particularly students. on campuses among students. I think number one, there's just too much information in the public domain on Israel's treatment of the Palestinians that um, that pro-Israel advocates, Netanyahu apologists, can cover up. There's, there's, too, too, much there's too much uh, apartheid uh, for the student conscience to bear, you could say. Exactly. So you can't yeah. sort of say that Israel isn't doing these things. But I think the other important political and cultural shifts are greater awareness in the West about historical injustice. I think the Black Lives Matters movement was a major shift where there's a basic sense, if you were sympathetic to the protests around George Floyd, there's no way you're going to be a Netanyahu apologist. All of your sympathies are with the suffering of the Palestinians. There is now on all university campuses a deep recognition and realization about the historic injustice against indigenous populations. I think that helps 
the Palestinian narrative sort of get some serious consideration. People are just, um, um, the average person, I think, is just very much aware of, of what's happened historically around marginalized communities, and they can apply that to the case of Israel-Palestine. Ironically, I think also that the Netanyahu, sorry, the, 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 the Trump factor has actually indirectly helped make an argument for Palestinian human rights because Trump was so outspoken and so pro Netanyahu that even if you didn't have strong views on Israel-Palestine and you simply hated everything that Trump did, because Trump was so pro-Israel and pro-Netanyahu, there was a sense that, look, you know, there's something really toxic here in this one-sided. Well, and it was also Netanyahu being so openly um, uh, pro-Trump. That too, that relationship, you know, I think has created openings and opportunities for people to speak out. Um, so I think among the broad reading educated public students, my professors, um, major shifts, as you know, within the American Jewish population, particularly among the younger generation, there's no way that anyone who's raised in an American Jewish household with Jewish ethics is going to be able to support what Netanyahu is doing to the Palestinians. So that's an important, I think, shift um, also that that we can that we can sort of um, uh, um, mention. But I think what hasn't changed is that the elite politics of these universities and elite politics in the United States at the level of the White House and the Congress, in that realm, the, the, the Likud lobby wins almost every time. Uh, particularly at Congress, we can still see that. There's been, you know, some changes um, among more courageous voices, but overwhelmingly, you know, that's the realm where the Likud lobby dominates and is able to impose, you know, its view of the Israel-Palestine conflict on U.S. foreign policy. And then we see this manifesting itself at universities. So the people who attacked me, they can't organize a public event to deal with the realities of Israel-Palestine. What they'll do is they'll weaponize bogus charges of anti-Semitism against people like me, who happened to be a leader on campus and fighting anti-Semitism, and then take that to the university provost and chancellor and lobby them very heavily saying, look, we've got a problem with anti-Semitism. We've got this alleged anti-Semitic professor. Well, You've got, sure we've got a problem. Yes. So now I've got the problem. But this is, I think, the, the this is the well, so by, by you, I mean, you know, the university. The university has the problem, right. Uh, and so that I think this is how these things are working. And so in many ways, one could sort of make an argument that um, uh, it's impossible to defend Israel's human rights record toward the Palestinians anymore in a public domain. Like on university campuses, as most people will know, there is very little, almost zero now pro-Israel activity or activism. It's almost exclusively pro-Palestinian or it's silence. Uh, but how no times have changed. A lot of it, yeah, exactly. In the realm of public opinion, in the realm of debate, in the realm of intellectual thought, among my colleagues, for example, here, people here are either, you know, um, pro-Palestinian, uh, but no one is willing to come out and sort of defend what Israel is doing because it's morally indefensible. And I think that's a general, that's a victory. But I think where the next um, battlefield lies for those of us who believe in a just and lasting resolution of the Israel-Palestine conflict is particularly in the realm of elite politics. That's where, you know, um, the side that supports justice for Israeli and Palestinians, that's where we're incredibly weak. And that really, you know, uh, necessitates um, a certain organizational sophistication, getting involved in party politics at the local level, at the state level, at the national level, being able to sort of support candidates who are not going to be intimidated by APAC and by the Likud lobby and are able to sort of go to Congress and do things like, you know, Bernie Sanders has done in terms of sort of standing up and, you know, speaking honestly and, and, and truthfully about what needs to shift in terms of U.S. foreign policy toward the Middle East, Israel, Palestine in particular. So I think we need to acknowledge the positive shifts that have taken place in terms of public opinion, in terms of attitudes. But we also, I think, have to recognize how many more important battles still remain to be fought before we can, um, you know, bring this conflict to a just resolution. And and on that note, I'd like to ask you a final question. Um, you know, I, we mentioned the cases of Norman Finkelstein and Joseph Massad, and of course, there are many others. But um, uh, yours is um, one of the most uh, recent ones. When you look at your own experience and the outcome um, and your continued uh, demands for investigation and accountability, 
and and the fact that that the university um in one way or another had to backtrack from its participation in the campaign against you is it possible to conclude you know as we approach the 75th commemoration of the nakba is it possible to conclude that the tide is finally turning with respect to these campaigns against um uh university faculty or um is it is that a premature judgment and and your case is perhaps an exception that proves a rule i think it's a mixed bag i think it's much more difficult for um the Likud lobby to do what they were able to do in the past by simply you know um imposing their will on um senior officials at universities um and getting them to orient the policies of the universities in the direction of you know a right-wing zionist position so it's much more difficult for them to do that but in my case they were very successful at least in the early phases of this crisis to get the university to issue a very defamatory and morally indefensible statement against me so i think um we need to acknowledge that public opinion has shifted you know educated public opinion on university campuses both students and faculty are not willing to sort of tolerate the politics of the past as we have seen it manifest itself before over the years um but there's still i think you have to be vigilant i think that's the big takeaway if you're not vigilant and if you're not willing to sort of spend some time in defending yourself and this does take a lot of time i think one of the takeaways here is that part of the intimidation um plan here of academics such as myself is to get them to self-censor is to get them to think twice do i really want to make my life this difficult if i say because, something because defending yourself right. is a full-time job it is it requires an incredible amount of as one of my colleagues put it unpaid labor to organize and mobilize people on your behalf when you would think that this entire controversy that happened to me and at many other universities could have been easily resolved if simply the chancellor of my university had the leadership skills to say thank you very much for your phone call but at this university we respect academic freedom that would have been in the end of it but the refusal of university professors to uh, university administrators senior ones to do that then opens the door to these types of scandals forcing people like me if you want to defend your reputation and if you want to speak out consistently in defense of human rights to take a lot of my time away to mobilize faculty in my defense and to defend my academic reputation so this is this is i think very much uh part of the challenge going forward it's to intimidate people get them to stay silent and i think there's actually a lot more i think you would agree with this moin there's a lot more um support for the plight of the palestinians among colleagues at universities and among intellectuals but they're often intimidated in speaking out because they know if they do say something in support of the palestinians they're going to get charged like i got charged with being anti-semitic and no one wants to have david horowitz and the defamation league all over them exactly and so i think part of the challenge here is you know how do you push back against these bogus charges of anti-semitism while at the same time not trying to feed into rising anti-semitism that we see in 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 society i think one of the problems here and we saw this with the ken roth scandal at harvard is that to make an accusation that there are these pro-israel groups who are lobbying university officials and threatening donor contributions to universities unless the university bends in their direction does come very close to perpetuating a very dangerous old anti-semitic stereotype about Jews working behind the scenes using money to lobby officials to you know dictate policy so i think all of us who care about these issues have to be very mindful that we don't want in any way to feed into anti-semitism but at the same time we don't want to leave um we don't want to uh, let these groups that are engaging in this type of sort of very unscrupulous behavior defaming academics with bogus charges of anti-semitism we don't want let we don't want to let them to get away with um being held unaccountable for this type of behavior so it's a very careful line that you have to walk and i think it really takes you know some education and it takes some um nuance to be able to walk that line and i think that's part of the training that people at universities i think have to go through if they're going to be outspoken on the question of palestinian human rights they have to be able to be aware of where the minefields are they have to actually be able to sit down with university administrators in advance looking back i think one of the mistakes that i made is that i didn't meet with the provost and the chancellor when they came onto the job and let them know about 
This is the What's background coming? to Israel-Palestine. Yeah. This is the things that might happen at our university. I just wanted to let you know, let's have a open communication. I think perhaps had I done that, this scandal perhaps could have been avoided, but I think that's the broader lesson for other academics, student groups working on campus is to engage in that type of, you know, dialogue and communication with university officials so that someone on the outside, like some, you know, Likud lobbyist can't sort of pounce on, on the scene and say, we've got a big problem of anti-Semitism and it's this professor who's allegedly doing X, Y, Z, and then the university without knowing anything, any background on the politics of Israel-Palestine, then, you know, in many ways is forced, forced to publish a statement like they did in my case, condemning me for alleged anti-Semitism when, of course, those accusations are completely groundless. Nadir Hashimi, thank you very much for sharing your experiences and insights with Connections. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you. It was mine, Moeen. Stay in touch.